impact stories where we celebrate academic scholars, academic heroes in, in the academia. And today we are privileged to have in our Miss Professor Fola Shade Obrushola. We'll go on a quick week and when we return, we'll get to meet our hero. So stay tuned. In its effort towards converting knowledge to profit, the University of Lagos established the Entrepreneurship and Skills Development Center, which has, since its emergence, successfully partnered with world-class corporations such as Coca-Cola, LG, General Electric and Lufthansa, among others. We're training our students to become creators of jobs. We need partnership with multinationals, we need partnership with many Nigerians, and partnership with federal government to begin to develop this school, I mean these students, inside the campus so that they can create their jobs. If national development and community service are crucial goals to be achieved by universities all over the world, then postgraduate education cannot be taken lightly, for it is at this stage that we see the results of the foundation laid at the nursery, primary, secondary and undergraduate levels. Today we have Professor Folashade Ogunshola. Before we start, before we go in and to know more about you, we want to go into your background as a child, your family tree. Can we get to know you? Thank you very much. Um, I am the first of five children. Okay. Um, my f there are two girls and three boys. Okay. Uh, funnily, all the boys are engineers, okay. and um, I'm the only doctor. Uh, my sister refused to be a doctor because she said um, she saw that I read all the time. Oh, okay. So that wasn't, um, she's an economist. Oh, okay. uh, my parents, I actually grew up in a university. Uh, my father is a professor of geography, um, Professor Akima Bogunje. And my mom is a lawyer, was a lawyer. Um, she's, she retired as a judge okay. um, from Mogo State. Um, but I had a, an idyllic childhood uh, at the university. So um, I don't know, is there anything else you want about um, beyond that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, what about your, what primary school did you attend? Ah, okay, that's a little bit, um, I, I attended quite a number of primary schools. Um, I went for my kindergarten at the staff school okay. in University of Ibadan and then moved from there to Mary Hill Convent School, Agudi Ibado, where I left in class five mm -hmm. to go to um, <coughs> secondary school. At that time, I wanted to go to secondary school in Ibado because that was where all my friends were going. Mm -hmm. But my mom uh, is an alumnus of Queens College, Lagos, Lagos and she yeah, was yeah. determined so that her daughter go, was going there. Yeah. But I was taken in King's Queen's College because I got, I, I got admitted into Queen's College, St. Anne's, St. Teresa's, Queen's School. So I had a lot of choices. Mm -hmm. But she said, no, we'll wait till Queen's College comes, comes out. And in those days, it comes out in the newspapers. Mm -hmm. So um, I went to Queen's College. Um, my grandmother was one of the foundation members of wow. students in Queen's College. Mm -hmm. So it's, they were trying it's, to keep yeah, off the keep tree. The tree yeah, yeah. At, uh, in your secondary school, did you hold any leadership position at that time? Yes, um, I think class prefect, uh, class okay. captain okay. Uh, sometimes. Um, I think when I, w I started off in lower six, so I, st I had a prefect position, but I left for university. I didn't finish my uh, um, advanced level HSC as we called it then. Okay. Um, and I was also a very unlikely sports captain, and that was a coup. Um, I was a terrible sports. I didn't like sports. Oh. But so my friends, uh, we used to do, during sports season, we used to have uh, cross country. Okay, yeah, so yeah, you'd run from yeah. Queen's College to, through Yaba, my Ian Barracks, back to Queen's mm -hmm. College. I hated it because we wake up at 5 a.m. Okay. So I devised the means with friends. And when they're all, when we all go out, you just, you know, you just sneak to one side so that you are close to the finishing. So when you see the first, you know, the really good sports people running, you let them pass there. You see, you just come back. So people knew me for not liking sports, but I was popular with the junior student, you know, the, my junior students. So they decided that I would be the sports prefect. prefect. And I did. I was. I was. 
the worst <laughs> thing, but we did well yeah. because I, I think I'm a little competitive. Okay. So I didn't want to fail. fail and fail. my house was known for not doing well in sports. There are too many people like me. But we managed to ginger people. And for that first time, we came second in sports wow. to that wow. year. So that was nice. Um, I think that was probably the most memorable. Mm. But I think the most memorable thing that I took out of Queen's College um, can be captured by something we did was my sports teacher. Um, we were going into the field and we were trying to open it. Somebody had locked it and you know how they put chains around uh, a gate and you can't get, so we had done, uh, yes, it had, we, and, she, and so we were ready to give up. She said, no, a human being did it, you will do it. We were there for about two and a half hours, but we opened that gate. And that sort of captures the Queen's College spirit. You don't it's give up. You keep, there's always a way. So you look for that way. And I think that works, has worked for me oh, all through, yeah. yes. Do you remember any of your classmates? In Queen's the, College, yeah, uh, Queen's I College. carry my friends. Wow. I'm one of, wow. I have my friends from primary school. Oh. I have my friends from uh, Queen's College. Um, some of my classmates, um, one of them is uh, Justice of the Supreme Court, okay. Justice Kekere Ekon. Um, a number of them, some of them have retired now because they retired 60, um, have been permanent secretaries in government. Um, one, a few have been commissioners, many are judges. So, and so obviously, it's the yes, we still meet. Yeah. We meet um, every other month. In, our, in each other's houses. Uh, we've been meeting, the first meeting was actually in my house in 1990, 1990 I think. Uh, two of us sat down and thought, why don't we start that? Sunday. And we've been meeting ever since. Okay. We've met okay. over a hundred times. Yeah. Had, yeah. Yes, yeah. and what, the, what has kept us going is that we give back to the school. Okay. Yes, so we were the first people to do the sick day. You know, we just do things Then we sponsored some blind girls through school to you through university because we realized early on that if we're going to keep meeting we had to be meeting meaningfully yeah, meaning so we've been just. doing that or every year in fact um there was one last week but i okay. couldn't go okay. uh, i had a fall so i could i was Sorry. asked to oh, okay. sit so we it's been I, I i've kept my even the ones from primary school we keep we, we, we are still very close. Mm -hmm. Those ones are even more like family wow. now, wow. yes. And our children are uh, friends. They are, they, they, yes. they are keeping in touch. Okay. And the university too. I've kept my university friends. Your university friends. Okay. Yes. As a child, every, every child has that dream, that vision, that ambition. What was your career dream? What did you dream of? Well, let me say, I, I knew I wanted to take care of people. Okay. I suspect that at that time I wanted to be a nurse okay. uh, because, you know, the nurse's uniform was beautiful. So it wasn't really a doctor at that okay. time. So I used to have the dolls and I would place them, you know, uh, you know like a ward. Baby and take dolls. Baby dolls, oh, okay. all sorts of them. I remember we had um, someone who used to take care of us okay. and she was leaving. She was, we loved her very much. And one of the things she told us was the way she's, she goes, she'll send us dolls, uh, hospitals, you know, little, you know, yeah, children believe yeah, anything. Yeah, anything. And we were so sure that well, she was going to send us all these things that would allow us to continue to take care of dolls. So I think right from the start, I've loved, I love taking care taking of people. Care of I actually like harmony. I like people around me happy. But I'm a bit firm. I, I believe in things need to be done Do properly. Right. You know, so uh, I think till very recently, I thought I was extremely soft. Then I was still, uh -uh. No, yeah, no. not. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, I, I, it, it, it was quite uh, an eye opener, you okay. know. But, uh, but I realized the problem, the reason would probably be because I like things done properly. Okay, yeah. So, in between that, somehow that allows there needs to be some structure. structure yeah. Yeah. yeah, so from Queen's College, you proceeded to University, University of Ife, now okay. Obafemi Awilo so University. A bit about that? Okay, so I went back to Queen's College for my A levels. Okay. I was there for a month and then got admitted into Prelim in University of Ife. I think I was one of the first, we were, we, there were about five of us from my set. 
we were one of the first sets to be admitted very young. I, I wasn't 16 when I went wow. into a fair. Yeah. Wow. Um, but it was, I think, one of the best times of my life. If I w it was easily the most beautiful campus. It had a, a rich culture. We, things like watching plays and music. I mean, I think at that time for young people, one of the major um, bands from the US, okay. Shalama at that time, came to Ife. Fela came to Ife, you know, so uh, we had films, we, you know, and the students did a lot yes. of the things. Ife okay. is, uh, is, is not a cosmopolitan place. So we made our fun. So young lecture students would come together, put things together and bring in films. So we would watch films in our main auditorium, you know, and it was, it, I think it was a fantastic time. Um, life was just so... If I just, if it was where it was happening, you know, people would come from University of Lagos, and because we didn't have much to do outside, we all were very close. close Till yeah, today, yeah. if a students are That's very close. close, yes. Then the, we were all like tomboys, you know. I mean, we used to laugh at University of Lagos girls that when they danced, okay. their powder didn't leave their face. You know, they, they danced and they didn't sweat. sweat. If a girls, I mean, <laughs> we were all, you know, it was, it was the, nice. The, uh, yes, we were yeah. tomboyish we, yeah. because we all sort of just played. So it was really um, a, gr a great time in my life. And but it was also a teaching time. If I was also reputed then to be one of the toughest universities, okay. um, the general thing was um, if your course was four years, you say four plus X. Four plus four, X. Four plus X. Uh, because if you, we didn't do course system. So if you fail in June, the almighty June, if you fail, you get a receipt. If you fail that, you repeat the year. So wow. you only need to fail a, a sub subject. And um, I, I learned in my stay in IFE. I entered through prelim. Mm -hmm. All my life I had been first five okay. in school. So, uh, yeah. I think um, when I entered Queen's College, the first year I was in the first 12. Okay. I didn't like that. Yeah. So I ended up in the first five again. First, okay. first five, first three in my class. Uh, first five, first five, you know, and without much effort, I have to say. Then I got into university. Yeah, I kept studying, but I, no effort. No effort. Um, I did well in the areas I was really Science. good at. I was, yes, but we had a bit of further maths, which needed extra effort, and I didn't put that extra effort in. So I failed it, and um, I had to have a receipt, which I failed again. Wow. So I repeated the f my prelim. But it was the best thing that happened to me in my life. Okay. Because what it did for me was I never took academia for granted again. And I never failed again. And it was a lesson for my BSc year. Um, in the sense that I started, no matter what I'm doing, I would plan my work. I would read every evening after school. Meetings. Just go through my yeah, notes, yeah. read my no, uh, my textbook, and add notes to my. So, and then after that, I can go and play. But I, you know, it's changed my approach to work. Um, I was very ashamed. I, because I didn't even come back to school with my books. I was so confident I would pass, and I didn't know how to face my parents. So I promised them that I would never do such again. Mm -hmm. And there is nothing when you have a job, you must deliver on time so that has been the sort of thing that and those kind of experiences and it has also been useful for me in counseling and mentoring younger people so when when i was provost uh, you failed i said you know failure is really and is is a chance to do it again and do it better and learn more because you do learn more you learn not just the work you learn a bit more about yourself about your character um, when I repeated for about three weeks, I didn't want to go to class. I couldn't imagine it. And then it wasn't as if I was bad in class. I was teaching people in class. So nobody thought I could fail. And, you know, so I had that same confidence. It also taught me not to believe your own publicity. Just keep doing your work your and way. keep moving. Um, so that's, that was... So you proceeded to your, for your BSc? Well, I proceeded for my 
med medicine. medicine. And then we did medicine in Ife, we had a, a seven year program. Okay. So you do a BSc, health sciences, which didn't do anything for you, don't worry. Okay. I don't talk about it because you can't, you can't use it. Okay. It's more like the second MB. Okay. And then you go on and do your MBC. But the BSc for us that year, when I did it, yeah. there were, I think there were 81 people in class, okay. 11 girls. There was, God knows what was going on. Um, but we know that there was a lot of uproar and many people did not cross over from the BSc into the clinical class. Mm -hmm. I think only about 11 of us crossed over. I was one of them. Now, if I had not failed prelim, you I would not have yeah, been one of them. I wouldn't have changed my work ethic. Wait, so yeah, it's, it's, approach, it's yeah. yes, it so you. it helped me. Um, a lot of our class failed. Part of it was a particular course where most people were given Fs and things. So. Um, but it, I never fell into that again. So I, at that time, I thanked the experience of the initial failure because it told me, if you think you're smart and you don't work hard, you're not going to get anywhere. There's talent everywhere. It's really the persistence, the hard work that moves you forward. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. as a medical student, what were some of the challenges you faced, especially as a female? As a female, hmm. you know, I, I actually don't know that I actually thought no, of myself as a female. female. <laughs> um, I never grew up um, thinking of myself as a girl or yeah, a boy. boy. It, gender was not a thought yeah. in my mind. Um, and maybe because I had three brothers. Okay, I, so we, we used to fight and, you, you know, yeah. so, and my parents treated us the same way. Everybody was treated the same way. Um, but w when I got to Ife, as a female, I think the only thing, I think we started to feel that difference okay. more when I started to work. Yeah. Um, because you find that people's expectations of a female are low. They think they can't do it. Sometimes they don't bring things to you because they think you're female, so you can't do right. it. Um, and then if you make a mistake, they assume it's because you don't know it. Whereas if a guy made the, uh, the same, same thing, they would just say, oh, yeah. no, no, it's he is, is a problem, you know. Yeah. So you find you're, you're, you're judged a little harsher. Um, but, and because you also carry a lot of responsibilities from the family, you have to make up your mind that you're not going to use family as an excuse not to move forward. Because truly in the workplace, who cares about what's going on in your family? Oh, yeah, yeah. And if you want to move forward, you can't eat your cake and have it. Have it. The work, the work, uh, um, the work um, environment could be kinder for women because I don't think it's built to support women. But if we're still in it now, then you decide that you will delegate to people. Um, the, you cannot do everything. Mm -hmm. So you've yeah. got to sort of take your eyes off some things and recognize you can't be 100% at all times. And once you, 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 you are at peace with that, that yeah. you'll recognize that sometimes you'll mess up, yeah, either at yeah, home yeah, or at yeah. work. Yeah. But forgive yourself and keep sure, moving. Sure. Your master's degree, you proceeded to, you did it here at Unilag. Uh, yes, I came you? here to Unilag. Okay, yeah. that's another thing. Before, when I finished medical school, I did my house job, okay, youth call, and had uh, got married, had two children, and then worked in private practice okay. and got bored. So I decided to do a master's. Now, the issue for me was which master's? Um, I mean, I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do. I was sure I didn't want to do surgery, but I was good at it. I was, because that was my best subject, actually, in medical school. I wanted to do ONG, but I liked the O, that's obstetrics. I okay. hated the gynae. Uh, my experience during house job was such that there were lots of infertility, we never sorted them out, lots of cancer, very miserable. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, I don't want this. Um, then I was going to do pediatrics, and for most of my um, private practice life, that was where I was. But then HIV came. Okay. And I had a brother, a brother-in-law who was in medical microbiology, who had been talking to me for a long time to come for medical microbiology, and I had been refusing. One, my experience with medical microbiology in Ife was not okay. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't very interesting. I couldn't, I couldn't 
you know, place it beside medicine. I, yeah. I just thought it was this subject that I did and I would go on. Um, part of that was because a lot of our training was by people in the biological sciences, so that the slants they put on it was very heavily biological, you know, so it's, it was not very interesting, uh, and I hated it. But gradually, while I was in private practice, I started to appreciate the value of the medical microbiology. When I was doing my house job, I realized a lot of things we were doing in medicine, we couldn't move forward because the lab was an impediment. We, we weren't getting good results. Yeah. So gradually, all sorts of things happened. I started to appreciate medical microbiology, so I came in here to do it. Um, and I started in 1989, and I came out with a distinction in medical microbiology. I think the most important thing for me that year was the fact that I all constantly underestimated my results. So I used to come out and say, hey, I didn't pass. I remember my statistics, I came out and I was crying because when everybody was talking, my results did not tally with what it everybody was, was yeah. doing. So I went home and said, ah, D or E. Mm -hmm. And I came first. Oh. I was very, no, maybe not first. Okay. Let me not say Talk. that. But I got a very high grade. I think, I can't forget because statistics was not my best oh, okay. subject. Yeah. I think I got 86%. Now, whatever that was, they asked for me. And when the man saw me, he said, you? Why? Because during classes, I didn't understand what he was talking about. So I read it on my own. And that's why my confidence level was very low. You know, so, um, so I did my master's there. OK, we'll go on a quick break. And when we come, we'll talk okay. about your career. OK. All right, there's still impact stories. And we have in our midst, Professor Folashade Ogunshala. We'll go on a quick break. And when we return, we'll continue. The University of Lagos prioritizes student welfare, and this is perhaps one of the reasons why management has invested heavily, despite severe funding constraints, in providing amenities in the hostels, classrooms, as well as laboratories and workshops. Vigorous efforts have been made to encourage private sector participation in the provision of accommodation on campus. However, as the University of First Choice and the Nation's Pride, there is always severe pressure on available facilities. All the same, management continues to do its utmost in meeting students' expectations. Welcome back. That's a still impact stories, and we are still privileged to have in our midst Professor Paula Shade Ogun Shola. Welcome back. Thank you. Yeah, we talked about your Masters. Your childhood, your MBSc, your master. So now we we'll go to your doctorate. You proceeded to Wales. What informed your decision to leave Nigeria and travel all the way? <laughs> Actually, it's not that straightforward. Okay. Uh, because I'm a doctor, I first of all went on to do my postgraduate training in medicine, okay. in clinical microbiology, okay. which I started here during my master's here in, in Luth, Lagos University okay. Teaching Hospital. Okay. College of Medicine. Um, so while I was doing my master's, I was also doing the Lagos University Teaching Hospital. Um, I was going through my professional exams okay. because you need to do exams. And we had, so we, I was reading and working to get my fellowship for National Postgraduate Medical College and the West African College of Physicians in Laboratory Medicine. So while I was doing that, one of our lecturers, Professor Rutimi, he's gone to, he was one of the ones that went to Saudi, okay. encouraged me to go for a PhD as well. So I finished my first exam. The, our professional exams are in two parts. So I f finished the part one okay. and then proceeded to Wales um, as part of the year abroad. So I went to Wales. We had a friend there, uh, Professor Duerden, who headed the anaerobic lab at the College of Medicine, University of Wales. And I went there to do that. I was there for two years, wow. finished my bench work, finished everything. But because I was still in the National Postgraduate Medical Program, I had to come home. Okay. Um, they, I was lucky to get an extension. So I knew I was under pressure. In addition, I had just had a baby. I had a four-month-old baby before I went to Wales. So I, I, I went and the only thing I did was my bench work. And so I finished in two years the bench work, started to write. 
but I could, the University of Lagos, Luth said I had to come back home. So I came back home, that I would continue writing here. And that's when the hitch began. Because I came back in 1994. I had finished my bench work. And it took me like three years to finish, to actually get the PhD. Two years I finished, but to come, I come, you know. So, because when I came back, I was told here, you have to start your, your part two. You have to do the part two exam. I mean, it was a, pre, it was a time of pressure. So I came back, I had to start studying and doing my, because the part two exam is also a thesis related okay. time. I did my rotation. So I was working, I was trying to do my part two, and I was trying to write my PhD. The PhD suffered because I just put it to one side and, yeah, you yeah, know, I was writing a little bit, sending it to Wales, writing a bit. And um, so I finally got the PhD. Um, and not long after that, I got my, I first got my part two, okay. the first part two in, um, of the National Postgraduate Medical College. Then I got the PhD, and not long after that, I got the West African College of Physicians pro, um, final exam. Okay. So I got about three in about two years, you know, but okay. they were all interwoven. Okay. Um, so so uh, let's talk about work. Yes. Work. All right. Um, when we st when I started work, the department was quite small, okay. and medical microbiology was not really the most interesting specialty for a lot lot of young People. doctors. Yeah. Most of us want to do OIG medicine, physics. I mean, physician um, physique. That's a med a medicine ONG pediatrics. You know the usual ones that everybody talks about. But laboratory medicine was not popular, was not um, in interesting, and there were some people who felt oh, only the daft people went mm -hmm. into, wow. but it's very fundamental to, to medicine. And one of the most misunderstood is medical microbiology, and it's also highly technical and very, very cerebral, because the microorganisms are constantly changing. So you have to really keep a head of the, okay. you have to keep to uh, in the books. You can't, you can't do micro if you're not reading all the time and seeing what's going on around the world. So I came back for my career. For a while I was bored. I, I felt I wasn't challenged. A lot of things I, I knew how to do. I, my work really was in uh, an organism we weren't doing here really, uh, Clostridium difficile. And a lot of work I did was in molecular biology. And I came back home, and there was, the equipment wasn't there to do what I had learned to do. Um, but, you know, you persevere. Um, I remember asking my head of department at that time to please give me broken down equipment, and I repaired them with my money. I just felt if I'm going to sit here, I might as well do things. So I started what I could do, you know. Um, then something happened that changed my life. I think the first thing that happened was I realized that if I was going to stay here, I had to do things. So I, I started my research. But I also started mentoring and training. So I set up a study group for residents. I was, I was already a lecturer okay. for residents to keep training them. So I it started with about four. And I said, look, we take care of ourselves. I brought tea. I brought, you know, I would sit down. I would give them assignments, and then I would review those. It, it was a two-way thing, because I would give them things I myself didn't really know, but I had re re really big books, so I would go and read up, and we would have discussions, and sometimes we would have cases that would you work. And so, so gradually that grew to a, a huge amount, that the number of people. But the thing that was significant was one day I got a call from one of the residents that came from General Hospital Lagos that was working with us and said, some people called me from Harvard University and asked for a medical microbiologist. And I gave your name. I hope you don't mind. I said, mind? I don't. I got a call. And that call, they said they were taking us to Senegal, that um, would I be interested in coming? I said, oh, I'm not. <laughs> and we went. It was, a, it was a professor, Phyllis Kanki. Mm -hmm. She had just gotten a Bill Gates 
Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation grant, mm -hmm. and they gave out sub awards to other people. But you had to write proposals to get it. So I went, and I found there were many people there. She was working in Senegal. She was working in Nigeria. She was working in Botswana. She was working in Tanzania. And, I, and in Nigeria, she was working in many universities, but no University of Lagos. Lagos. So I asked, why not? Well, they said, well, we're in Lagos, but we're not in the university. I said, why not? Well, so somebody said, you know, if you can write a proposal for a project, or a, and we take it, they'll come to Lagos. But in the meantime, we were having a laboratory uh, pr uh, the program of two weeks where we were trained and it was molecular biology. So I just started, I, I just threw myself into it. I got a prize for sort of like the best candidate. I had one or two colleagues who thought they were too senior for that. I, when I'm in a situation, I just enjoy the situation. So I wrote, I decided to write a grant and I did, but I didn't tell anybody because I was so sure I was not going to get it. Mm -hmm. And the thought of sharing my failure around it, yeah, but yeah, I didn't yeah. tell anybody. And I wrote this grant. But it taught me two things. Nobody knows everything. Because in writing that grant, I got information from other colleagues. I had some work to do with the Pediatric Association of Nigeria. I had to mm -hmm. go to Gambia. And while I, I took my little proposal with me, when I got there, I spoke to some of the people who had written grants before, and they put me through, they critiqued it. In fact, by the time I looked at that grant, it was full of red biro. I was so upset, but I was happy because it's, you know, it was taking shape. And then somebody said, you know, this is your little grant. There's a professor from London who is here. Let him look at it. I wasn't, too, but you know, I carried my grant. He read it and came back with some suggestions. So I incorporated all that and then incorporated from other colleagues in other specialties. Because mm -hmm. I realized everybody has a different perspective. It taught me to appreciate people's specialties. Yeah. And I sent it in. And I didn't hear anything. And then I got a call to come to Abuja for a lecture, uh, for a program. They were doing a conference and that I was going to chair. I got there and nobody talked to me about this grant. And I was so sure people were avoiding my eyes. You know, I said, ah! You've messed up. <laughs> but on the last day, Professor Kanki, she hadn't spoken to me throughout. We were in the dining room, I can never forget. She looked at me and said, oh, beautiful. I wish she had said that at the beginning. beginning I would have enjoyed <laughs> the conference. I spent yeah. the whole of that conference not, sh not talking to people and trying to avoid people's eyes, eyes. because I was so sure I had failed. failed. You know, I came back extremely happy. Then I got a lovely letter from her that the work was scientifically sound. I keep that letter. It's brown. I, in fact, I, I decided I was going to frame it. I, I've forgotten I'm going to get it out and frame it. It set me up that kind of encouragement that, oh, I can do it. Because my thought was, I'm sitting here in Nigeria. How dare I think I can write something for Harvard? Wow. You know, and I haven't looked back. Um, that project was, for me, a turning point. It had both care and it had research. I actually built a clinic on the beach in Kuramo. It's, okay. a, it's in a very, sh it's a shanty town. Okay. It was, Kuramo was is known, I, I didn't know. So Kuramo was known for commercial sex workers, okay drug addicts, um, uh, thugs, and so on. Now, there was a priest there who I had spoken to. So I had been to Kuramo. He had a church there. And I went. I didn't know that there were drug addicts. I mean, I didn't know yeah, anything about Kuramo. So, so sometimes like ignorance it. is bliss. Yeah. So I just went. And so we decided to do the clinic near his church. and to study HIV and hopefully get antigens that can be used. However, before we finished, um, the clinic was raised to the ground because there were problems okay. on the, they, they were fighting and they burnt it. But more importantly, treatment came for HIV. So we couldn't keep the study going because once there was treatment, treatment so we changed it. Okay. And I haven't looked back. Okay. From that, all the things have come. So talking about research and talking about HIV, you are known as 
one of the leading researchers and the researcher who spearheaded the research during the Ebola outbreak and during, yeah, during the Ebola outbreak. Can you say a bit on that? Well, I would say the Ebola outbreak was research. Okay. That was just an extension of my work. Okay. Um, while I was doing HIV, I really became, I was more interested in how do you prevent it? Okay. I was more into the prevention of HIV and I was also interested in prevention of infections in general. In general. So it was in that light that Ebola became a part, part of what of I your, did. Yeah. And so I remember, I, I, again, I think one, one thing that has shown that I have learned which my father used to say, but I now accept it as part of, is that you must not, in doing your work, be focused on what you will make out of it in terms of money. money yeah. Face what you can contribute, then the money will come. And the whatever it is will come. So for me, infection prevention and control was something that was re I was passionate about. Because by the time people are coming to hospital for treatment, so many have died in the community. So the, the more you can prevent infections, both in the community and within the hospital, the better it is for everybody. So it was on, in that light that I gave, a, I, I decided that sometime that I would go for conferences, whether I was sponsored or not. So I used to put money aside okay, for, for to such. fly. Of course, you go the cheapest ticket possible. You go to the cheapest room that you can get. Yeah. Yes. And we, I did. And I said, if I'm going for this conference, which was in South Africa, I will present something. So it was something we had done at the Lagos University Teaching Hospital that I, had, I put together. Even that one, I spent my money. And I presented it. And while I was presenting it, I just saw two people who were smiling and nodding their heads. They were from the World Health Organization. And they invited me for lunch after my talk. We had a discussion, and they said they'll get in touch with me. About that time, not too long after that, there was an Ebola outbreak in Uganda. And I got a call. I had never done that before. And they said, would I? Oh, no, not, no, that was not Ebola. There was, that was not it. So they called me okay. and said they would like me to come to WHO Afro um, and that we would do a training. I came to Ghana, okay. which was, uh, so we came to do training in Ghana. It was my first time with WHO. Okay. And so I was with them for two months. I stayed in Afro in Brazzaville as well. Then the year after, there was an Ebola outbreak in Uganda, and I got a call from, uh, from WHO Geneva that could I go and train in infection control for hospitals around Uganda. I said, yes, I l I'm adventurous. I'm actually not scared of a lot of things. And I just thought, this is what I love. I love going up and down. And so I went. There were many things I didn't know, but I learned, and I put together the report. We did the training. And that, for me, was fantastic. Then I came back. And I've been invited a number of times oh, since then. Then the Nigerian one happened. And wow. you are the, the first rest is provost. First um, female. female. Yeah, sorry, you are the first <laughs> female provost at the College of, of Medicine. Medicine. How, was your, how was your experience and how did you get that? Hmm. First of all, it was never on my agenda. Okay. Um, I was really enjoying my academia. Okay. And I was traveling a lot. Um, I still do. Um, so I, somebody came to meet me. In fact, the person was from the faculty of pharmacy, which was about two years before I even became provost. And I said, you know, have you ever thought of going for, I said, provost? It's not on my agenda. So, but a number of people kept coming. Um, and by 2011, None, not more people. So I started thinking about it. That what is this provost they are all talking about? I, I looked at it. Who wants to be in the administration? You know, you just look like a lot of headache. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, all sorts of things and the pressure. So I, I, I realized that part of why I wasn't accepting was I really do hate the campaigning thing you know you go around people you don't know yeah, you uh, yeah, I say this is what I have done well, what I have. Yeah, and I thought I said what have I done by so anyway somebody said you know don't worry so there are people who will tell you what you have done they will write it for you so I did 
But the most difficult part was campaigning. And I realized I had to own it. And I re also realized that one of the problems I had was just walking up to people I don't talk to. Yeah, yeah. So I decided to start a, a bulk SMS thing to say, look, I'll be coming to see you. It was very general. So I'll just say, oh, did you see my SMS? Um, you know, I, I needed an introduction. Yeah. And so gradually it became OK. And then I, it, it is by election. Okay. Now, we had had someone do that before, a female. I don't think they got up to a dozen votes. Medicine at the top is really quite male dominated. Um, but I also had this belief that if I, d I would do my best, that's what I always believe, that you do your best. If it doesn't work out, then that's, it wasn't meant to be. Sure. So, I, so I just, I remember praying. I said, God, if this is not for me, just dabaru it. That's the word I use. I said, just scatter, scatter it, it, scatter it. Um. And um, so we did. Um, we went, there were lots of bad, you know, you know politics. I would get home and say, they said this about me. My husband mm. said, that's politics, don't worry. But it, it also toughened me a little bit. Uh, you, because you realize as you go into leadership positions, you must be ready for people to tell lies about sure, you. Sure. You must be ready for negative publicity because people don't always understand what you're doing. And then you will also have enemies you don't even know you have or you don't even know how you got them. And once I made peace with that, I... The, we were three of us, and I, I won. Um, I, it, was, it was, I think, I, I wasn't sure how it was going to go, but I knew that my message had to be about service. So I did a lot of homework. I found out where could we make money, how can we, so that if I could do things, I would promise. But my focus really was, how do I build our academic potential and our research potential? And that, the rest is history. History. Okay, <laughs> moving now to your um, position. DVC. As the DVC. Yes. The first DVC of this, I, we heard it's a newly created. It's a, it's a new, um, new yeah. role, but it wasn't created. I don't think it was created okay. for me. Okay. I just think I'm the first person that occupied it. Thanks. Okay. Um, the University of Lagos has a 25-year development plan. plan. Um, one of the good <laughs> things about University of Lagos, and I think previous vice chancellors, is that we've been very lucky we've had progressives. So they, they, t they tend to like structure and systems. Okay. So this development plan noted that there were areas we were not good in. And okay. so they developed the development services was to take care of internationalization, okay. um, innovation, okay. advancement, um, and um, entrepreneurship. So it had been written, um, but I don't know what happened. But I, I got it. I, I was in 2017. Um, I wasn't expecting it because I, I finished my provostship in 2016. I had quite a lot of things I needed to do. I, I had grants that I was running and yeah, I'm still, still running. running. So for me, I was ready to go back to my academia when the last, the previous, uh, the past, just the immediate past um, vice chancellor offered me this and the Senate approved it, and here I am. Wow. Hmm. As an achiever, we can see we can see one award here. <laughs> can you share some of your awards and your um, wow. research grants and awards with us? Okay. Um, I've I've actually gotten a lot of research grants. Okay. Um, I think some of the, the I think the one I'm most proud of. Well, don't let me see. The one that set me off okay. was the SOB award from the Bill Gates grants yeah. from through Harvard. And since then, I've been involved some on my own as the principal investigator, um, gotten research grants. But I think the ones that probably make a lot of noise are the ones that have been associated with the National Institutes of Health, okay. Betsida in the United States of America. So right now I'm running a major grant called BRAINS, um, which we coined ourselves, called Building Research and Innovation in Nigeria Science. It's a Fogarty, um, a Fogarty Institute um, grant of about $3.5 million um, over five years. We're in the fourth year now. But before that, I was the site PI for what you call the Medical Education Partnership Initiative. Um, I think Ghana got one of that okay. too. Um, 
in which I was the PI for the Lagos site. That was a collaboration of six universities in Nigeria. I was the PI for the Lagos, Lagos site. It's about medical education. And that was five years, 2010 to 2015. But we got an extra year till 2016. Um, so, and that also was an NIH grant. And we had, had done PEPFA. We had the PEPFA grant, um, which is the Presidential Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Again, I was the PI for the College of Medicine. And, but a lot of my work was in the community. I actually have something, I have a thing for those who don't have access. Um, and I think as I have moved, I've realized that my style of leadership is to facilitate people. I'm more, in, I don't believe that if you're in leadership position, it's like you should take everything. Yeah. No, what you do is you build people so that people do their thing and you'll find you'll always be surprised and gratified by the um, ingenuity, the innovation people bring to their exactly. position. So right now I'm controlling a number of places, um, the innovation and I'm working with some pretty amazing young uh, men and um, women and hopefully by the time I leave the structure of this office in terms of what we do would be in place. I'm a bit of a systems person. My belief is that if you're managing something, then you should so construct it that if you're not there, yes, it so works well. without you. Sure. So I also head the HIV reference laboratory. I work with some really amazing young technologists and technicians and, and they're running. They're working as though I'm not there. And one of the things that I've, I keep getting things like, they're highly motivated, they're, you know, and I'm not there. So it's really, for me, I was there for a long time and we developed a system. And we also developed, I would like to develop minds that if we're going to truly develop, then we all have to start thinking of how do we improve our environment? If it's about everybody taking, then nothing gets done. But if you do 150%, you would enjoy your work, sure, sure. you know, and so they work. And they keep coming up with new things. So I meet them infrequently, and work is going on. In fact, I'm just to totally amazed. So it's, if we have problems, they call me. They keep me updated, because again, that's another thing, communication. So, so let's uh, focus on this award. How well, did it come about? I don't know. The Medical Women's Association. Um, in 20, I think that is actually the record. Is that the, I'm not even sure if, that, if it's that one. Okay. Um, they, there was a vote, and I was voted the Medical Women of the Year or something Merit Award. I, I, I I'm well, just surprised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I was called, and they said they had done that. Uh, but before that, uh, they had given me another award um, earlier on. I think that was in. Tw I was still provost then. I got one. Then this one was the Lagos State. That one was a national, I think. This was Lagos State, being the medical women as uh, a member of the association. Well, I'm a member, but they gave me a merit award okay. Um, okay. for meritorious service. I, I, I'm very humbled. All I'm right. very humbling. All right. So briefly about your social life. Can we get to know <laughs> the man behind this beautiful and successful <laughs> lady and your children? Okay, uh, my husband, okay. who is also my best friend, wow. um, we met in university. I think we met probably about my first year in okay. university, okay. and we've, we've been going out since then. So I've known him for practically my whole adult, more or less adult life, uh, I think over 40 years, 40 something years. Uh, we went out about uh, nine years before we got married, right. and um, He's a chartered accountant. He's extremely smart, very smart. Um, his brain is more mathematical. I'm more, I think my brain is more creative and, um, yeah. you know, he's very precise. Uh, yes, he's, uh, yes. Um, his name is Shagun Mushola. Uh, he owns his own firm. He used to work with Coopers and Library. And I remember very early in our years, and he's, very, he, he's a very confident person. He decided he was going to start his firm. Everybody said, ah, the economy is bad. The eco maybe you should wait. Just went ahead. So I was one of his first employees. You know, at night when he gets a job, I'm helping him to wow. do the balance sheets, you know, and things like that. I mean, whatever. 
Uh, we have three children, um, one girl and two boys. Uh, my daughter is an economist. Um, she's married with two children. Um, the first son is an engineer. Um, he did, um, he works with main one, um, cable. He's got a, t a daughter he's married to. And my baby mm, yeah. uh, is, uh, is working. <laughs> he's, uh, I think he's 27 years old now. Oh, so okay. he's not married. So we're waiting. I said, mommy, you're waiting a long <laughs> time. Um, so that's my immediate, my children family. and my, my, f yeah, my nuclear yeah, family. Yeah. But I have lots of cousins and it's a big family on yeah. both sides. Yes. As a, you look very young, <laughs> a young <laughs> grandmother. What's the secret? Do you have a um, favorite spot? Sports? Yeah. <laughs> well, did I you hear me? You said it initially, <laughs> but still there may be something oh, that keeps but I, you. I think I... Uh, maybe jeans. Okay. My mother is 85, okay. and she honestly doesn't look it. Wow. Um, I think maybe because I'm engaged with what I do. do I tend yeah. to move. I think till I came to these jobs, these administrative jobs, I'm very on the go. Okay. Um, I'm not the best in terms of sports. In okay. fact, it's a standing joke in our house. I'm always starting something. I never, in terms of sports, I'm never getting through it. Uh, but I think maybe laughing a lot. I don't take myself too seriously. Um, I, I truly just don't have time to, um, to I, I think the other thing is, I tend, my friends once said, that I tend to look for the good in people, generally. So it's very hard for me. I don't hold a lot of grudge yeah, in yeah, me. Yeah. So maybe that's it, I don't know. I think yeah. I'm just blessed Your that way. Your favorite food? <laughs> My favorite food. There was a time I would have said dodo. Oh. That's fried plantain. Yeah, yeah. But now I truly don't have a favorite food. I, I think the easiest thing, I would say my easiest food that I don't dislike is rice. Um, white rice. You don't like rice? No, I like okay, it. But I don't like dislike it. Okay, it's easy for me. Dislike, At any yeah. time, yeah, so I would eat it. But okay. I don't know that it's my favorite food. Okay. But I think uh, maybe rice. But you, sh you can see, food okay. is not really yeah, my yeah, yeah. major thing. thing. Okay, no. you've, you mentioned a lot about mentoring. Anybody you're mentoring now? Well, I, 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 I think I do a lot of what you call informal mentoring. Okay. Um, I, I didn't realize that was what I did. I think I do it as a natural thing. thing yeah. Because I Just really nice. do facilitate. And I tend to take an interest in people's lives. So if but I don't push myself on people. So if I, I give, you know, I just, so I find that I have a lot of young people around me. I talk with a lot of people and I'm very willing to share my time. If I, nowadays it's not as often yeah. as before. Am I mentoring somebody? There's a young man I'm mentoring um, because I like his spirit. He's um, very persistent. He came looking for me because he wanted some, he was a, he's a student here. Um, he, his name is Busayo, okay. and I find that I'm suddenly in, involved in his life, but I'm pushing him. My mentoring, actually, I tend to push you to break your boundaries and keep testing yourself. Um, for me, my boundaries, many boundaries. I was a very shy child, bookworm. So for me to be here talking to you so and not being shy, shy, I've moved. Yes, well, you say you're a fulfilled <laughs> woman. In many ways, in yes. a way you are now. Definitely. Um, I think my fulfillment is less about the office as much as the people Impact. I have. The, the people that have impacted and the people who have impacted me okay. and the people I work with. I have been really blessed by a lot of people being kind to me. And I, when I was 50, I, I looked, I did my birthday. And the only thing I felt was gratitude. And that's all because bad things haven't happened to me. I've, I've seen them. But what I realize is I honestly do not remember them because no matter what is you're going through, I always believe nothing lasts forever. So there's always a light. I may not see it immediately, but I know I will if I keep moving forward. So that's my philosophy, that you keep moving forward, bad things happen to good people, but 
you don't let that, there's no tragedy if, if you don't stay down. Just get up and keep moving. You'll get out of it sooner or later. You pray that it's sooner. Sure, amen. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, before we go, your accent is quite unique. Is there any, what's the secret behind it? Did you really stay abroad, apart from apart your college of, days? Apart from my PhD, I've yeah. lived all my wow. life in Nigeria. Wow, wow. And it's, I'm a very proud Nigerian. Yoruba. You, I'm mean, a Yoruba woman, woman, but a proud Nigerian. Oh. I really get, my husband says I should calm down. I get pissed off, pardon me, when people, when Nigerians blast Nigerians. Mm -hmm. And because I believe that our problem is that we see the blot on a white paper. We don't see the white paper. There's sure. so much good in Nigeria. I'm one of those who believe that. Wow. Well, thank you very much for, thank for you sharing very much. your morning with us. <laughs> thank you. Hey Africa, this has been Impact Stories and I've been your host, Iyoha Joan Ikuya Isokin. Do stay tuned for another edition. Bye.